Amen. In our presentation yesterday, we were discussing the subject of the seven times in Leviticus 26. We discussed an important principle that, and I've introduced this a number of times now, that when we get one dispensation here, and a second dispensation that this is essentially line upon line you take this history and this history and you parallel them together that's called parable teaching but when the Millerites approached the subject of the 2520 they didn't do that they went from this dispensation here which is the dispensation of the seven kings of Judah and the seven kings of Ephraim and they went from that history all the way to their own history the history of the Millerites and this was there seven times or 2520 now what I haven't done in this, in this study of the 2520 is go into all the Spirit of Prophecy proof text and to construct the logic of how we would defend this to be true. I approached it from a different perspective. I wanted us to look at this history here. The original application that's given in Leviticus 26 and how we should understand what it was teaching us. We saw that after a 490 year period of probationary time at the very end of that we see this number seven these seven kings and these seven times prophecy that's given there here at the end and it's a punishment so we had 490 starting with King Saul bring you down to these seven kings the same seven kings of Judah here and we saw that these seven kings were going to receive a seven times punishment and this was the close of probation and it was going to result in 70 years of captivity we saw that these seven kings were beginning at Manasseh and the last three kings were Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim and Zedekiah and these are the four seven times of Leviticus 26 verses 18, 21, 24 and 28 and we looked at some of those verses and explained the prophetic significance behind the imagery that's being brought to view. One example that we saw was from Jehoiakim. We saw that in verse 21 and 22 and 23, it talks about many beasts coming to destroy the nation and the children being taken. And we saw that that happened in the history of Jehoiakim when you realize that beasts are nothing more than just a symbol of nations or people. So that's the logic that we used to demonstrate what Leviticus 26 is all about, this seven time prophecy. But when we approached the subject, we approached it from not Leviticus 26, but we approached it from the subject of Habakkuk, if you remember, Habakkuk chapter 2. And I'm saying Habakkuk chapter 1 and chapter 2, this burdensome vision that Habakkuk's going to uh, experience and give to the people, that he's going to make plain upon tables, is the same history, it's the same story. It's all leading down to the captivity. So, we saw that in Habakkuk 
chapter 2, it talks about tables. And we made an application from the two tables of stone, Ten Commandments, and now we're going to see that those tables, as the Millerites understood, and as Ellen White confirms, are these charts, the charts that are on the wall here. When I say the Millerites understood that, obviously the Millerites only understood one of those charts, this one here, the 1843 chart, because they didn't even produce the 1850 chart. This chart here, 1850, is produced by the people who come out of that experience and it's being guided and directed by the spirit of prophecy, by Ellen White. She's, she and her husband are directing the work that's going on in the creation of this chart. There's quotes that we could um, discuss from the spirit of prophecy. I think Sister Katenda has mentioned some of them. So I'm not going to um, really discuss those proofs. So let's see if I can find one passage. I want to read a statement. This is taken, it's written by um, James White, sorry I forgot his name for a moment. Um, let me just find it, see if I can find another quote. Um, We'll read the Ellen White statement first. This is taken from 13 manuscript releases, page 359, paragraph 1. 13 MR 359, paragraph 1. I saw the chart making business was all wrong. It originated with Brother Rhodes and was followed out by Brother Case. Means have been spent in making charts and forming uncouth, disgusting images to represent angels and the glorious Jesus. Such things I saw were displeasing to God. I saw that God was in the publishment of the chart by Brother Nichols. And if you check carefully here, I don't know if you can see it, at the top right hand corner it says Visions of Daniel and John and their chronology published by O. Nichols, Dorchester, Massachusetts. So this chart that she's talking about is the one here on this, on the back of the wall here. If you have a look at this one, this is produced by Joshua V. Himes. This is by O.T. Nichols. So the one that she's talking about here by Brother Nichols is this chart. It's the 1850 chart. I saw that there was a prophecy of this chart in the Bible and if this chart is designed for God's people if it is sufficient for one it is sufficient so it is for another and if one needed a new chart painted on a larger scale all need it just as much I saw that it was a restless and easy and satisfied and grateful feeling in brother case that desired another chart I saw that these painted charts had a bad effect upon the congregation. Congregation, It caused the light, chafy spirit of ridicule to be in the meeting. I saw that the charts ordered by God struck the mind favourably, even without an explanation. There is something light and heavenly in the representation of the angels on the charts. The mind is almost imperceptibly led to God and heaven. But the other charts that have been gotten up disgust the mind and cause the mind to dwell more on earth than heaven. 
Images representing angels look more like fiends than beings of heaven. I saw that the chart had for days and weeks occupied Brother Casey's mind when he should have been seeking heavenly wisdom from God and should have been growing in graces of the spirit and the knowledge of the truth. I saw that if the means that had been wasted in getting out charts had been spent in getting out the truth clear before the brethren in published tracts, etc., it would have done much good and saved souls. I saw that the chart making business has spread like the fever. This is taken from manuscript uh, one. The reference I gave you was 13MR, page 359. And it was written in 1853. What did we say had begun after 1850? Evil. Remember we said that evil has entered the church. So you can see that God's people are doing all manner of foolishness. And one of the things they're doing is trying to create their own chart. And you can only guess the reason for that. Often it's to be famous in some capacity or to generate some kind of income. God's people have got a fascination about the desire to promote themselves and the desire to make money from the gospel. And it's something that uh, we have to guard against here at the end of the world, that we don't fall into these same traps. just want to make a couple of points uh, from what we've read. She, saw, she says that the chart-making business, this money-making scheme of trying to um, be pro get pro some kind of promotion from the gospel is all wrong. She tells you who it originated with. with. It says... It says the chart that we should be focusing on is the chart by Nichols. Uh, later on she says I saw that the charts ordered by God. So the th thing we want to see is that this information has been ordered by God. She speaks specifically about this chart but she's already spoken extensively about the 1843 chart. So I'm saying this information um, talks about both. It says, I saw that the charts ordered by God, charts in the plural. The only two charts that she's referring to are the charts that are here on the wall, the 1843 and the 1850 chart. These were ordered by God. And even if you don't understand what's on the chart, she says they're pleasing to the eye, pleasing to the mind which is interesting. I don't know if you remember, we read from Thoughts on the Mount of Blessings, page 6, paragraph 1. When Jesus spoke to the multitude, it said they'd never heard these kind of words before. They didn't understand those words. And whatever Jesus was preaching was in opposition or contrary to what the church taught. And even though there was this contradiction between what they heard in the church and what Jesus was saying, the people were willing to listen. And why were they willing to listen? Alan White uses this word, it's not my word. She says that the people were spellbound. So there was something magical, if you like, about the words that Christ was portraying to the people. And that's almost what she's saying here. She says, there is something light, lovely and heavenly in the representation of the angels on the chart. The mind is almost perceptibly led to God and heaven. And she contrasts this with these charts that men are making. So even if we didn't explain what these charts meant, they were produced in such a way, the artwork, and not only the artwork, but the structure of the charts, draw you in and they lead you to imperceptibly think about heaven. I was travelling once and I had to bring my own charts with me and 
when I arrived at the airport, I went through customs and I had a tube with the two charts in it, it's smaller versions of these ones, and I got stopped at customs and they wanted to know what I was carrying. So I opened the tubes up and they looked at the charts. The first thing this, the officer said was, what's the value of these charts? Because they look like some kind of ancient manuscript. So even people in the world can see that they look different to you know, modern things. They could see there was something special about these charts. So I thought that was a really interesting experience that I had. So what I want us to see is that she says there was a prophecy of this chart in the Bible. And this chart was designed for God's people. And if it was sufficient for one of God's people, it was sufficient for everybody. So everybody should understand and have or possess this chart. She mentions that there's a prophecy of this chart. She doesn't tell you where the prophecy is. I'm saying that prophecy is Habakkuk chapter 2. The Millerites already knew that Habakkuk chapter 2, when it was fulfilled, was fulfilled by the creation of this chart here, the 1843 chart, and then she says that this chart here was also a fulfillment of prophecy. And the fulfillment of prophecy is the same prophecy, because what the Millerites had overlooked is that it says tables, not table in the singular. And so that's the reason why we know it's the pro fulfillment of Habakkuk chapter 2. Later on down, it says, I saw the charts ordered by God, charts in the plural. So in her writings, she says, this chart was ordered by God. In Great Controversy, referring back to the Millerite history and referring to Habakkuk, it says this chart was a fulfillment. But in both passages, it says tables in the plural or charts in the plural. So that's what the connection is to bring them together. I want to read another statement. This is taken from James White. This is December 1850. James White, Advent Review in Sabbath Herald, page 13, paragraph 6. The reason why this passage is important to understand is because this is when this chart here is created. It's created in 1850 and it's published around November, December time. I think it's actually published in December. Um, let me take you to another passage before we read this one. This is early writings. Page 74. It says, the September 23rd, the Lord showed me that he had stretched out his hand a second time to recover the remnant of his people, and that efforts must be redoubled in this gathering time. In the scattering, Israel was smitten and torn, but in the gathering time, God will heal and bind his people. It's a famous passage. Most of us are familiar with this. trying to find another pass passage that deals with this same subject. So we're reading it from early writings. And I just want to find another source for this one. It's the same passage, but this is taken from um, a magazine called The Present Truth. So in The Present Truth, this was published in November, November the 1st, 1850. So this magazine is published then, and it says, September 23rd, the Lord showed me that he had stretched out his hand. Now she doesn't give the year. She says, I saw, I had a vision September 23rd, and this magazine is published November the 1st, 1850. So when was this vision given to her? It was given in 1850. Contextually, that must be the case because in the early days, her writings were a lot less formal. They're much more informal. And she's writing to this small band of Advent believers. She says, a month ago, it's not even a month ago, it's really a week ago, I had a vision. 
and then she writes this article when it's published the following week, November the 1st, 1850. So you know that this is given in the year 1850. We're going to come back and read it from the early writings passage. So early writing, September the 23rd, the Lord showed me that he had stretched out his hand the second time to recover the remnant of his people, and that efforts must be redoubled in the gathering time. In the scattering, Israel was smitten and torn, but now in the gathering, God would heal and bind up his people. In the scattering, efforts made to spread the truth had but, a little, had but a little effect, accomplished but little or nothing. But in the gathering, when God has set his hand to gather his people, efforts to spread the truth will have their designed effect. All should be united and zealous in the work. I saw that it was wrong for any to refer to the scattering, for example, to govern us now in the gathering. For if God should do no more for us now than he did then, Israel would never be gathered. When is this written? 1850, just before the publication of this chart. She has a vision, and that's given when? September 23rd, 1850. So here's 1850, and she's going to have a vision, and they're going to produce this chart. The 1850 chart. And what does she speak about in this passage? She says, the Lord showed me that he had stretched out his hand the second time to recover the remnant of his people and that efforts must be redoubled in this gathering time. So it says in this gathering time. So what are they in now? They're in the gathering time. And when is this vision? 1850. So from 1850, we're in what period? Is this the first gathering period that they've had? It's not the first one, how do we know? Because she said the second time. She said the second time to recover the remnant of his people. So the gathering, another way to say gathering is what? Recover. Remember she says recover. So this is the secondary gathering. When's the first regathering? Sorry, not regathering, the gathering or the recovering. When's the first one? 18? 1844? People say in 1844? So we'll put 1844 and people are saying that this was the first. And someone else said what? I heard another statement. Another date. Did I hear another date? I thought I heard 1798 from someone. Did someone say that? So some people are saying that was the first gathering, some people are saying that was the first gathering. Then it says, and efforts must be redoubled in this gathering time. So wherever the first gathering was, what are you supposed to do now? Redouble. You need to redouble your efforts. In the scattering, Israel was smitten and torn. But now, in the gathering time, God will heal and bind up his people. In the scattering, efforts made to spread the truth had but little effect, accomplished little or nothing. But in the gathering, when God has set his hand to gather his people, efforts to spread the truth will have their designed effect. So when's this scattering period? For those of us who put the first gathering here, when was the scattering? Shout out, because I can't hear. 1798? So this was the scattering and this was the gathering. If this was the gathering, where would the scattering be? Before here? Okay, so if this is the gathering, where was the scattering? 
before. So we've got a scattering here and we've got a scattering here. Is that right? Is that what people are saying? We've got two options. Okay, so let me tell you what I think. We're going to introduce the subject of the scattering and the gathering. Obviously we can see that that's the language that Ellen White's using. What happens in 1798? What happens before 1798? We've got the 1260. And in 1798 what happens? First angel's message, time of the end, first angel's message. And what does the first angel say? No, he doesn't say that. Well, he doesn't say that either. What he says... Are we sure there's only one angel here, yes? There's only one angel. So he says... Come out of her, my people. Does he say that? He does. Because where are God's people? They're in Babylon. We agree with that? They're in Babylon and they've been punished or they've been scattered. So when it says, come out of Babylon, my people, where are they all headed to? To the United States, to the glorious land. When they go to the glorious land, they're all going to go back to their place. So they're all going to go back to their home, which we would call a gathering. They're all going to gather in what city? Jerusalem. So there's a gathering here. So this gathering, often we don't call it a gathering. What do we call it? It's 46 years. What do we call it? A rebuilding. So this rebuilding would be getting all the stones and doing what? Gathering them together and rebuilding something, yes? They recycled a lot of the stones when they rebuilt this temple. So this is the gathering. What happens after 1844? Did they, did they have their message correct? They didn't. <coughs> They'd made a mistake, hadn't they? They hadn't made a mistake upon the sanctuary. And so when October 22nd happens, what did they receive? A great... They, have a, they receive a great disappointment. And Alan White compares that disappointment in 1844 with another disappointment in another history. The history of Christ. And what disappointment is that one she's going to connect us to? The disappointment of the disciples when they take Jesus and make him a prisoner. We're familiar with that? So, by the way, when does that happen? In the literal story. What time of day? It's AD 31, Passover, 14th day, all of that, we know that. What time of day? Do we all know that? It's midnight. They capture Jesus at midnight. So here's midnight. We're not going to make any application of that. But what happens to the disciples there? They're scattered. We can go back to another story, the story of Moses, and what would this line up with there? This would be the Red Sea. At the Red Sea, are the people disappointed, greatly disappointed, a group of people scattered. Yep. 
the Egyptians are all scattered. So we have a scattering there as well. So here, 1844, what do we have? A scattering. This seven year period, what did they do? They restore what? They restore the Sabbath and and the image of God in man. That's what the work that they were required to do. And basically they locked themselves in a room and they were doing this work for this seven year period. Did they try to share the message with people? Yes. Did it take much effect? No. This is what she's referring to. In the scattering after 1844, Israel was smitten and torn. But now in the gathering time, God will heal and bind up his people. In the scattering, efforts made to spread the truth had but little effect, accomplished but little or nothing. But in the gathering, when, God's, when God has set his hand to gather the people, to gather his people, efforts to spread the truth will have their designed effect. So the creation of this chart here, what does it now give to the message? Starts giving power to the message, doesn't it? It starts having effect. It says in the scattering there was little effect. Nothing much was accomplished. But now with this second chart, efforts to spread the truth will have their designed effect. So God had a design. He had an idea. And his idea was from 1844 the chart, this information, was going to do what? Was going to have an effect upon people. This is the third angel's message. Are we okay with that? Third angel's message is going to have an effect upon the people. But the problem is, in this scattering period, these charts, which connect to the third angel's message, are not going to have their effect. Why doesn't it have its effect? because it needs a second witness, a second testimony. There are some issues on this chart that are not clear. They're not clearly represented here. They need to be explained in a better way. So a second chart is going to be produced and upon the testimony of two, now this thing is established and now the truth will have its effect. So there's something special about the 1850 chart that produces a, an effect that God wants to have or God wants to give. I saw that it was wrong for any to refer to the scattering, for example, to govern us now in the gathering. For if God should do no more for us than he did then, Israel would never be gathered. So in this history here, God wants to do something special. Something special for his people. And at the same time, what the people enter into? Evil. They, en they enter into evil when he wanted to do, to do something special. And how was he going to accomplish this special work? Through what means? Through what mechanism? Through the chart, through the production of this second chart. That's what it was designed to do. Then she says this. I have seen that the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and that it should not be altered, that the figures were as he wanted them and that his hand was over and hid a mistake in some of the figures so that none could see it until his hand was removed. Then I saw in relation to the daily that the word sacrifice was supplied by man's wisdom and does not belong to the text and that the Lord gave the correct view of it to those who gave the judgment hour cry. When union existed before 1844, nearly all were united on the correct view of the daily but in the confusion since 1844. When does confusion happen? After 1844. What does confusion bring? It produces scattering, doesn't it? So you know that this is the scattering that she's referring to. 
It's nothing, it's nothing, nothing I made up. It, it's verifiable. Other views have, em have been embraced and darkness and confusion have followed. Time has not been a test since 1844 and it will never again be a test. The Lord has shown me that the message of the third angel must go and be proclaimed to the scattered children of the Lord, but it must not be hung on time. I saw that some were getting the false excitement arising from preaching time, but the third angel's message is stronger than time. It's stronger than time can be. I saw that this message can stand on its own foundation and needs not time to strengthen it and that it will go in mighty power and do its work and will be cut short in righteousness. What is she talking about? I believe there's a lot of misunderstanding on this passage that people make. She has a vision in September 1850. A week later she writes an article in The Present Truth explaining this. Years later, it, I think it's actually 32 years later when early writings is written. It's written in 1882, a long time afterwards. Let me give her a chronology of this. We've got November the 1st, 1850, and then we've got this early writings, which is 1882. Now, in 1882, when this book was written, it was a compilation of two books. One of them is the book that we're reading from now, which is called Experience and Views. Now, the book Experience and Views was written in 1851. Let's give the coding for that. EXV. So, it's originally November 1st, 1850, then it's written in 1851, and then it's written again in 1882. And most people read it from the early writings passage, which is fine. The, the early writings passage was tidied up from all the original ones. In the original, uh, these two here, the language is slightly more cumbersome, so she, they, they, the editors rewrite it, it's been re-edited. So she's seen this vision here in 1850, and it's in the gathering time and they've been producing this chart for many weeks beforehand it doesn't just spring upon them and it's going to get published I think it's December 1850 so they've been thinking about this chart for a long time and now she has this vision in September published in November and they're going to produce the chart in December and she's going to compare the scattering and the gathering. And we know the scattering is here after 1844. She's then going to say this. I have seen that the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and that it should not be altered and that the figures were as he wanted them. That his hand was over and hid a mistake in some of the figures so that none could see it until his hand was removed. Now these figures that she's referring to, what are these figures? Now if you go to a dictionary and you look at the word figure, it can have more than these meanings, but we're gonna, I'm just going to say it has at least these two. So we've got figure, this is a figure, this is a figure. A figure is a symbol of something. You've all heard of a figurine. A figurine is like a doll. A doll is a figure of a human being. The word figure can mean this, and it can also mean 
this numbers we agree with that so it can mean both we read where did we read from our first spirit of prophecy quote Um, where, where we read that the 1850 chart was really beautiful and all the figures, where was that? What, what was that reference? I've forgotten. 13MR, that's it. 13MR. Okay, and we know this is written in 1850. Good, so we've got that. What did she say specifically about the artwork? The artwork is what? Earthly or heavenly? She says it's heavenly. So the artwork or the figures are heavenly. And she's going to compare that with the artwork of these other charts, which are what? Earthly. She almost calls them devilish. We okay with that? So, let's come to here, now to the early writing statement. When she says figure, she says there was a mistake in the figures. What figures is she referring to if all these artwork figures were all beautiful and they were almost divine sending you into this spell because if you just looked at it without an explanation it was all beautiful it would take you where? to heaven now if you were looking at this what would you need to ha what, what would how would you explain all of this? you'd either have a teacher or you'd read everything, yes? So if you don't read it and you don't have a teacher, what would you what would you be looking at? The artwork. So you know the artwork, is there any fault in that? No fault in the artwork. So when she says there was a mistake in the figures, she's talking about the numbers. So, so I spent some time just to make this point, which I, I think for most of us is obvious. But the thing is, the reason why it's not so obvious is because people say, we do that, I say people, we in the movement have this argument. I have seen that the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and it should not be altered, that the figures were as he wanted them, that his hand was hid over a mistake, singular, in some of the figures so that none could see it until his hand was removed. So what we're going to do is, we're going to say this chart and this chart, the figures is this 1843, which is the mistake, and they're going to correct it and make it 1844. So that's what we normally do when we go ahead and present this, which is correct. All of that is correct. Singular mistake. Only one mistake on this chart. Is there only one mistake on this chart? No, there are other mistakes on this chart. But there's only one mistake that has any prophetic significance, and that's this date, 1843. And this is now going to be corrected on this chart. But she says, I have seen that the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and that it should not be changed. So why not just get that chart and change it? What's funny about that chart? Funny is not the right word to use. There's nothing funny about the chart. What's connected to this chart? You may, be not, you may not know what I'm asking, so I'm going to tell you. The Lord has shown me that the message... Um, time has not been a test since 1844, and it will never again be a test. The Lord has shown me that the message of the third angel must go and be proclaimed to the scattered children, but it must not be hung on time. So she makes that statement in connection with what? this chart and it's not being altered so she says that there's this chart which was directed by the hand of the Lord it shouldn't be changed there's a mistake on this chart and then she starts jumping straight into this subject of time setting or not having a message hung on time 
Now, if you see the difference between this chart and this chart, can you notice there's one obvious difference, a big difference? This one has all these calculations. You can see calculations here. You can see calculations here. There's calculations at the top. So all these calculations do what for you? They produce a message that's hung upon time. But when you come to this chart, do you see any calculations? No. There's some reference point here but there's no calculations on that chart because they're trying to show that the message now is no longer hung on time. When you start hanging messages on time, you're going to have to go and refer to this chart here to do that work because this chart doesn't allow you to do it. But at the same time, we're not supposed to have a message hung on time. We're not supposed to destroy that chart. But there's a new chart that's produced. Now, if we were going to be concerned about the mistake, what we would have done is just got this chart and changed the 43 to a 44 and left everything as it was. If we had done that, we would have produced a chart that's hanging on what? Hanging on time. It's all about time calculations. So that's why they're going to produce another chart because this chart is hung on time and this chart is not hung on time. It's about an issue of time. Now the interesting thing is, even though the 1850 chart is not hung upon time, does it have all the same dates? It has all the same dates. So you need both charts to actually work things out. So when we start talking about a message that's hung upon time, we have to understand what Ellen White's talking about because he's not talking about a message that deals with dates, is it? Of course it's not because this chart has many dates. But this one is all about calculating endpoints and how you do that calculation. How do you do the calculation? You have to use the foundational truth or methodology that the Millerites were using, which is one day equals one year. That's what that message or that chart is all built upon. So she says you can't use this methodology anymore. You can't use this methodology that's on this chart, so we're going to produce a new chart. The new chart has all the same dates on it, but it doesn't deal with a methodology of day for a year. And I just want to see if there's anything more that I want us to pick up from this. Okay, so that's what I want to deal with. There's a subject of the daily, which I just want to speak about again. Um, I want to read, read again. Then I saw, in relation to the daily, Daniel 8, 12, that the word sacrifice was supplied by man's wisdom and does not belong to the text. And that the Lord gave the correct view of it to those who gave the judgment hour cry. What's the judgment hour cry? Here, 1798. Fear God, give him glory, for the hour of his judgment has come. That's the judgment hour cry. Who's that? Who's giving that cry? Miller. So she says Miller has the correct view of the daily. Union existed before 1844 on this point when they were gathered. All were united on the correct view of the daily. But in the confusion since 1844, other views have been embraced and darkness and confusion have followed. Time has not been a test since 1844, never will uh, be a test again. So what brings unity to God's people? It says when unity existed before 1844, nearly all were united on the correct view of the daily. 
but in the confusion since 1844 other views have been, in, been embraced and darkness and confusion have followed so the scattering was produced by a mistake of what the sanctuary was we know that but, in, but what contributed to that was that people then had a different view of what the daily was so that added to the scattering what produces the gathering here first angel's message fear God give him glory for the hour of judgment that has come the angel begins to gather a people together they gathered out of where gathered out of Babylon that's why we can say come out of here, my Babylon and gather together but what's connected to the gathering what is the engine or the driver that's going to be connected with the first angel's message that's going to gather the people? It's the daily. Let me take out some of this information. So we've got the daily here. And the daily is going to help to do what? The daily is going to help to gather the people together. And what's the daily going to do here? So this is 1798. The daily here will gather. And the daily here will scatter. Because the daily here is the wrong one. And the daily here is the correct one. So the daily does what? It helps the first angel's message to do what? To gather the people together. This is the history of what angels? First angel and second angel's message. So we know that this daily is connected to these angels and the ministration that they're doing. Want us to see that? Okay, so we've read from that passage. Oh, let me read you one more. This was from James White. I gave you the reference for this. James White, 1850, 1850 JWE ARSH, Advent Review and Sabbath Herald, 13.6. 1850 James White's Advent Review and Sabbath Herald this is what he says I'm going to read two paragraphs back the 2300 days This prophetic period has been and still is the main pillar of the Advent faith. It is therefore of the utmost importance that we have a correct view of the commencement and termination of this period in order to understand our present position. 457 BC was the year presented and clearly proved by Brother Miller as the true date for the commencement of the 2300 days. It was published to the world by every second Advent paper in the land, by book and by public lectures as the true date. The proof was so conclusive that those who examined the point with candour or honesty embraced it at once. Learned opponents did not and could not show that we were incorrect in dating the 2300 days from 457 BC. With this clearly ascertained date for the commencement of the main pillar of the original Advent faith, lecturers went forth united to give the judgment hour cry. This was the date written upon the chronological chart of the visions of Daniel and John published by Joshua V. Himes. What chart is he talking about? It's this one here. It says Joshua V. Himes right at the top. So he's referring to the 1843 chart. It was the United Testimony of the Second Advent Lecturers and Papers that when standing on the original faith, what is the original faith? Let me read it again. I'm going to back up. 
with this clearly ascertained date for the commencement of the main pillar of the original Advent faith so the main pillar of the original Advent faith is 2300 days jump back down it was the United Testament of the Second Advent Lecturers and Papers when standing on the original faith that the publication of the chart was a fulfilment of Habakkuk chapter 2 verses 2 and 3. If the chart was a subject of prophecy and those who deny it leave the original faith then it follows that 457 BC was the year from which to date the 2300 days. It was necessary that the 1843, that, sorry, the 1843 should be first published, should be the first published time in order that the vision should tarry, or that there should be a tarrying time in which the virgin band was to slumber and sleep on the great subject of time, just before they were to be aroused by the midnight cry. So I want to summarize what he's saying. He says that the original faith of the Second Advent uh, lecturers and papers was what? 2300 days. So your faith is built upon what date? 457 BC. And he says if you come off that, what are you doing? Um... If the chart was a subject of prophecy and those who deny it leave the original faith, then it follows that 457 BC was the year from which to date the 2300 days. So if you don't believe in 457 BC, you leave the original faith. I've already given the answer. If you don't believe in 457 BC, what are you leaving? You're leaving the original faith. And if you're leaving the original faith, you're going to end up going into a different organisation. That's what I want us to pick up. Why is he writing all of this? What's the purpose of it? The problem is that in this period here, people are going to start changing their doctrines, their beliefs. Why are they going to start changing? Because they don't believe that 1844 was a fulfilment of prophecy. So they're going to go back and they're going to start changing the dates. What date do they want to change? 457 BC, because they want to start saying that the 2300 days is going to be fulfilled when? In the future now. Can we see that? That's what's being discussed here. That's why they produced this second chart. The second chart is to confirm that the first chart was correct, which was the original faith of God's people. But in this history here, there are people who are now time-setting and how are they time-setting? They're going back to the information on this chart and they're going to 457 and they're going to change 457. If you change 457 to make it a later date, you're going to start pushing the 2300 days forward and then you're going to start saying, well, maybe Christ is going to come in 1852, 1853. They were doing that in this history. They're trying to push things forward. So this is why Ellen White says this chart, the 1843 chart, is not allowed to be changed. Because if you change the chart, a hundred years later, God's people wouldn't know which chart is the right chart. Because they would have said, well, they've made this new chart, maybe the new chart is the right chart. So she says, leave this chart as it is, because it now serves as a witness or a testimony of what that the original faith of these believers was true or false that it was true. Then they produce another chart here, 
which doesn't address all those time setting issues. It's just going to do a couple of things. First of all, it's going to correct the date to 1844. Then it's going to add the sanctuary message. Then it's going to add the third angel's message. But the issue of time setting, it's not going to deal with because it's going to put all of that to sleep because they're going to say that the quotes here are all correct. What is time setting to do with when you start getting a message that's hung on time? When you start putting all the information together, it's not saying there's no time. It's saying you can't go back to those times and start changing them. What you can't change is 457 BC. That's what it means to have a message that's hung on time. You're going to take those inf the information hidden here, you're going to create new dates, new start dates, so that you can get new end dates. That's what time setting, according to early writings, page 74 is dealing with. But today, we don't use line upon line, we don't bring the passage together, we don't carefully consider the history, so we just say, you can't have any time at the end of the world. And that's a, not a correct application of what she's saying. So let's summarize what he has said. The original faith is dealing with 457 BC. The 457 BC is the 2300 day prophecy. And if you change that, if you start adjusting that, you're going to come off the original faith and you're going to essentially enter into a new organisation. That's the point that he wants to make. Now if we go to this chart here, it's relatively straightforward to see. I'm not going to talk about some other Bible passages or Spirit Prophecy quotes, except one more. This is taken from early writings. Hopefully I can find this relatively quickly. Um, early writings, page 229, paragraph 1. God sent his angel to move upon the heart of a farmer who had not believed the Bible, to lead him to search the prophecies. Angels of God repeatedly visited that chosen one to guide his mind and to open to his understanding prophecies which had ever been dark to God's people. The commencement of the chain of truth was given to him and he was led to search for link after link until he looked with wonder and admiration upon the word of God. He saw there a perfect chain of truth. So what's being discussed here, Alan White's talking about William Miller and William Miller is led to study his Bible and angels come and direct his mind and what do the angels give him understanding over? Or concerning it says the prophecies and then she says the commencement of the chain of truth was given to him so who gave him the commencement of the chain of truth these angels or God now everyone knows what a chain is a chain are links all connected together and what's given to him, it says very clearly, the commencement of the chain of truth. Commencement means start. So he's given this. And if you have the start, and you know how long a prophecy is, you can work out this one. This one is given, and this one is calculated. Everything okay with that? I'll read one more passage. This 
This is taken from William Miller. This is called William Miller's uh, Apology in Defence. 1845, W.I.M. William Miller, William Miller's Apology in Defence. I'll give you the page. It's page 11. The title of it is The Commencement and Termination of the Prophetic Period. So we just read from early writings that angels gave him the commencement date of the chain of truth and he's now dealing with a subject called The Commencement and Termination of the Prophetic Period. Farther from a study, sorry, from a farther study of the scriptures, I concluded that the seven times of gentle supremacy, Gentile supremacy must commence when the Jews cease to be an independent nation at the captivity of Manasseh, which the best chronologers assigned to four, sorry, to 677 BC. So he says the seven times is 677. Then he says this, that the 2300 days commenced with the 70 weeks which the best chronologers dated from 457 BC. Then he says the 2300 days is 457 BC. And the last one, and that the 1335 days commencing with the taking away of the daily and the setting up of the abomination to make it desolate were to be dated from the setting up of the papal supremacy after taking away of paganism in the year 508. So these are BC dates and this is an AD date. And this is the 1335. So these are the three prophecies that he's going to be dealing with and he says he used chronologers to look at the commencement. But what did Ellen White say that he was given? The commencement of the chain of truth. Now if you go to this chart and you look at the very top you'll see that there's a date there it says 1843 and then underneath that it says 1843 and then right here at the bottom it says 1843 you'll see all of these things just line up all together hopefully you can see that if you go to the top of the chart and come down one it says 2300 days 457, 1843. Where it says 457, if you go across into this column here and go up, you see it lines up with what year? 457. Hopefully we can see that. And then that date lines up with what animal? The ram and the bear. Daniel 7, Daniel 8. So they're marking that Daniel 7, Daniel 8, particularly Daniel 8, when the Medo Persians are being seen, it marks the year 457 BC, and they're going to mark that date there, 457 BC. They're going to jump across and do a calculation there to get to the year 1843. Now you can see that that's not the first or the beginning date. So, there's only three calculations there. So this is the year 457. It's the second calculation. If you come all the way down here, they run out of room, so they're going to do the calculation down here. They've got 508, which is this one here, and they've got 1335, and they've got the year 1843. So this is a second calculation that they do. And this is 508. And if you go right to the top, 
you can see the year 677 so that's the beginning of this chart so you've got 677 you'll see that these three dates are the same three dates here that William Miller has so what they've done this chart is a graphical pictorial representation of the information here that William Miller found from these breast chronologers every single one of these dates all lead you to the same place they lead you to this termination point that's given on this chart and what is that date? 1843 so this chain of truth that Ellen White speaks about that angels gave to William Miller is all of these prophecies now a chain is one thing it's not many things but it's made up of many elements it's made up of all these links so this chain is what? let's look at what this chain is now I've drawn this chain horizontally and I put four links into that chain let's get that chain and put it vertically so we get this chain and hang it vertically so here's the first link in the chain and this is 677 the next one is 457 the next one is actually let me put it as it is there on that chart here so that I don't throw you 538 457 and as you go down this chart they add all the links in here until you get to 508 and then it ends all the way down to the year 1843 so what they've done is that they've taken this concept of this chain and they just hang it down and you've got all the information that you need every single one of those dates is what? it's a link in the chain how many chains do you have? you have one chain so if you see the way that chart is constructed you've got this central column that runs like this and then you've got Daniel chapter 2 Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 8 all this is the book of what? book of Daniel what's all this? It's book of Revelation so you've got the book of Daniel and you've got the book of Revelation you'll notice that they skillfully avoid what chapter? chapter 11 they don't put chapter 11 down because they don't know anything about chapter 11 so you've got the book of Daniel the book of Revelation and all this information is feeding into this chain it begins in 677 and it ends in 1843 it's the chain of truth well let's remember that, that this is truth Alan White says this is truth and when we spoke about the chart she said this chart was directed by the hand of the Lord so it's truth and now she says this is the chain of truth let's look at this chart is this chart any different? 
you'll see that there's a central column which is identical to this one. The chart is very much the same as you have here. On this side, you have Revelation, and on this side, you have Daniel, but down here, you have this added extra piece of information. And the extra piece of information you have here is the third angel's message and you have the sanctuary model. They'd run out of space, so they redesigned the chart. But it's this central column that I want us to see. And what you're going to see, even though it might not have all the same information on it, is exactly the same chain of truth. It begins and ends in the same place. But what they do here, they highlight 457. Why are they highlighting 457? They're highlighting 457 because people have got a problem with 457 in that history. What made them have a problem with 457? Because now they're time said you have a problem with the heavenly sanctuary, but it's also they're going to now have this problem with the daily. So that's why James White is making this point. The issue is about 457 because it's a central pillar and foundation of Adventism. Because their focus is upon the sanctuary or upon the host. It's on the sanctuary, so that's why they have the 2300 days, because that's when the sanctuary is going to be cleansed. That's why he's using the number 457, because they're attacking in this history what? The sanctuary. So at the end of the world, God's people aren't going to attack the sanctuary, they're attacking the host. The subject of the host is what's going to be attacked at the end of the world. So all I want us to see is that the structure of the 43 chart is identical to the structure of the 50 chart. This is the chain of truth and this is the same chain, there's no difference between them. So both charts are truth. But what did Ellen White say? She says that the Millerites James White says the same, recognized that this was the fulfillment of what prophecy? Habakkuk chapter 2, she says, with this chart, it was a fulfillment of prophecy, and I'm saying it's Habakkuk chapter 2. In Habakkuk chapter 2, what do they need to do? Write the vision and make it plain. So, in Habakkuk chapter 2, what is the vision? The vision is whatever's on this chart. The vision is this truth. Or as Ellen White calls it, the chain. And what is that chain of truth? It's the information or the vision that goes from 677 to 4 to 1843, 1844, which is the seven times which is the 2520. So you know that the vision that Habakkuk speaking about is the 2520. But what did we say that vision was when we studied Habakkuk chapter 2 verses 3 and 4? He that readeth, let him run. Who's going to do the running? The just, the lives by faith, or the one whose soul is lifted up in him. So just to live by faith. This is justification by faith. If you're running to give a message, what are you giving? It's the gospel. So we know that this is the gospel. So when people tell you that the 2520 is a not a God, it's not a prophecy, it's a waste of time, means nothing, it's all error. What we're doing is rejecting the gospel for God's people at the end of the world. And we already know that's what God's people are going to do. They're going to reject the gospel. 
We teach that the everlasting gospel is three is a three-step prophetic testing message. It's in three steps. But earlier, I think you heard that Sister Terry said that the gospel is complete when? By what angel? It's complete by the second angel because the third angel is a demonstration or an execution of what's already happened. So you know that this gospel is actually in two steps. We read already, we discussed, that what was going to gather the people? First angel's message, gather the people, come out of Babylon, my people. But what else gathered the people? It was the subject of the, of the daily. And what is the daily? We understand, in agreement with the Millerites, that the daily is paganism. And paganism is the first part, or the first half, of the 2520. So you know the 2520 does what? It's what gathers God's people together. So you've got the first angel's message gathering God's people together. And the daily, or the 2520, gathering God's people together. So the daily is a symbolic representation of the second angel's message. Another way to say that is the seven times, or the 2520, is just another expression, another way of expressing the second angel's message. If you're focusing on Sister Katunda's message, you can demonstrate the same thing. If you go to 1840, 1842 and 1844, you can mark that this is April, you can mark that this event here is where the Protestants close their doors finally to the message. There's a shut door experience here for the Protestant churches. So this would be the third step. This is the first step and this is the second step. The second step here in 1842 when they begin to close their doors is produced by what set of circumstances? The 1843 chart is created in May 1842 and the next month the Protestant churches begin to close their doors. So you can see really simply in this history that the 1843 chart is a symbol or a representation of the work of the second angel. If you come into our history, the history of the priests, you have 9-11, you have midnight, and you have 2005. And in 2005, it's not the 1843 chart, but it's the 1850 chart that comes back into history in connection with the 1843 chart. So both charts join together and they're both coming in at the second step of this history. We know that Second Angel's message arrives 9-11, so there are many ways of explaining and understanding the importance and significance of the 2520. In summary, Habakkuk talks about the vision. That vision is not the 2300 day prophecy, it's the 2520. The 2300 days is a part of this chain. The complete chain is all of this. Part of the chain is this. 457 to 1843. This 2300 days here is only part of the chain of the 2520, which begins here and ends here. The focus on Adventism has been the 2300 days. But you can see the attack upon the daily 
because the daily is nothing more than the seven times, the 2520, is what initiates an attack upon the 2300 days. God's church in this history was focused upon the sanctuary. That's why they focused both James White and Alan White, their focus is upon 457 BC and not on the 2520. So hopefully we can understand how significant this date is to God's people as we approach the end of the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to give you praise and thanks for your goodness and mercy. We ask, Lord, for wisdom and understanding, that we might have a clearer understanding of what it means to not have time as a part of the message here at the end of the world. The relationship between the 2300 days and the 2520 and what the 2520 means to each and every one of us here as we stand at the end of the world. We ask for wisdom and guidance, Lord, in the precious holy name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.